checking to see if this is on. We are gathered here today to celebrate the wisdom of the Scottish electorate. Um, <laughs> actually, that's not why we're here, but some of us are pretty happy with the outcome. So, um, and I, I want to express that uh, the, the world is a better place this morning as a result of that. I want to uh, make a couple of administrative announcements before we start the program this morning. If you're watching on the web, you should be able to download uh, the slides that uh, are going to be shown here today. You won't be able to see them on the website, but you should be able to download them. They're on the same page there. If you're in the room here, would you please silence your cell phones and anything else that might make some noise or interfere? Uh, it's my privilege uh, now to welcome, uh, to introduce our guest speaker this morning, uh, to welcome my boss, the CEO and president of CSIS, Dr. John Hamry. John? Morning, every, good morning, everybody. Welcome. This, uh, I look around, this looks like a kind of a 12-step recovery program for government <laughs> officials, you know. I was just, you know, I look around, I think probably half, but half of you, I think, are still there, which I hope you have leave slips, that you, permission that you got here. So, But, I, but when the boss says he's going to give a major policy address on acquisition policy and acquisition reform, you want to hear it, and you want to be here, and I want to say thanks to Frank Kendall for giving us a chance to bring this to the policy community in Washington. Uh, it is a very important issue. We uh, like it or not, and I, I, I don't like it, uh, we're probably going to have to live in this sequester environment. I think it's going to hurt America. I really do. I think it's going to hurt our defenses. Uh, but it just doesn't seem that our political leaders uh, either understand it or have the will to do something about it. So it means that we, uh, and I'm putting myself in your place today, as, as people that are working these issues every day, we have to do something about it, which means we have to get as much purchasing power out of our investment as possible. Because it's where we just are going to be living in this environment where confused politicians can't see with clarity the world we're living in. And I'd say it's turned dangerous this last six months. But because of where we are and because of the, uh, this political climate, uh, uh, a serious steward of public good, Frank Kendall, is saying we've got to do better. We've got to do better as a, as a department. And uh, so he has been working, and I know he's been working personally on 3.0. I teased him on the way over. He's been editing it on the way I heard from his escort officer. So it's now 3.126 is what this is. I mean, this thing is moving, and we have to hear him this morning so we can at least hear it where it is right now. But I think it's reflecting the fact that his deep personal commitment to find the right formula so that we know all of us, and we're all in this together. I mean, the, the fifth service that makes it possible to defend this country is the private sector that helps us put the weapon systems we need to put in the hands of our troops. You're every bit as much a part of winning this, the Cold War, as were the people in uniform, and you're going to be part of the solution to defend this country going forward. Because you are partners, you carry a responsibility. And I think Frank is the person that's now shaping the outline for that, and we're very grateful that he's in the job at this time. We're grateful that he's willing to lead at this time. So with your applause, would you please welcome Frank Kendall to get this program started. Uh, good morning. Thanks for coming out. Uh, there's nothing more exciting than acquisition reform, right? Uh, <clears throat> what I'd like to do today is start off by talking a little bit about 2.0 and what happened to 2.0. And then I'll go into 3.0 and spend most of my time on that. I'm going to try to get through, uh, uh, hopefully tersely, all the different things because there's a lot there. And then I'll save some time for questions. I want to begin, though, by thanking some of the members of my team. And I want to thank CSIS, of course, for, for hosting this morning. Um, on my team, my deputy, Alan Estevez, uh, my, my right-hand man and my partner in crime here, uh, he's, he comes first, followed by the AT and L of AT and L, uh, Katrina McFarland, uh, Assistant Secretary for Acquisition, uh, Al Schaefer, Acting Assistant Secretary for Research and Engineering, and Paul Peters, Acting Assistant Secretary for Logistics and Material Readiness. Uh, I want to particularly thank my line managers in the services, uh, Heidi Shu, Assistant Secretary of the Army, Bill LaPlante, Assistant Secretary of the Air Force, 
and Sean Stack, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. They're the people who actually execute the things that are in whatever issue or, or version of acquisition reform or acquisition improvement we do. There are a number of other people I want to mention, uh, Dick Jimman and Shay Assad, kind of a team that does contracting pricing uh, for us. Very, very much a part of this. John Conger, my installations person. Andy Weber, who does nuclear bio and chemical programs. Uh, Tom Moorhouse, who does operational energy. Nancy Spurl does my administration for acquisition. Uh, Chloe Taylor, who does human resources, a key part of all of this. And Andrew Hunter, who does rapid acquisition. Phil Anton, who's my chief analyst and does a lot of the things that you've seen in the acquisition performance reports you've seen. It's a big team, uh, and it's a lot bigger than the people that I mentioned. Would you join me in thanking all those people and their colleagues? <clears throat> And I'm, as I look around the room, I see some faces of people I should have mentioned, so I didn't mean to leave anybody out, but uh, it is a great team, and I'm very proud to be part of it. Okay, let me have the slide on 2.0, please. I'm going to just spend a minute on this, but better buying power is about continuous improvement. It is about an evolutionary change, and it isn't about throwing out one set of ideas and completely replacing them with another set. It's about finding ways to move forward in areas where you can make the most difference and continuously examining your progress to identify those areas and to understand the influence of the things that you are doing to see if they're the right things need to be modified or needs to be a different focus. So 2.0 is not dead. 2.0 is alive and well. And this chart tells you where some of those things are. The code up there is that if it's green, it means we have done it. It has been institutionalized. It is part of what we do. It is no longer on the better buying power list per se, but that doesn't mean we're not doing it. Uh, we put out two versions of the annual report on acquisition performance. We're going to continue to do that. We're going to expand on the body of data and analysis that's in there and continue to use that to guide what we do. We've also assigned senior managers for acquisition of services. They're in place, so that one's complete. A number of others are well underway or just continuing activities. And you see some that are in black that are not uh, mentioned specifically in 3.0, but they are continuing. Uh, I'm sorry, the black ones are the ones that are continuing in 3.0 and are getting continued specific emphasis. The blue ones are in 3.0 also, but there was some change or some modification. So there's an enormous amount of continuity between 2.0 and 3.0. Uh, so if your favorite one is not seen to be as visible under 3.0, we're still doing it, even though it may not be emphasized and may not be on the list. I know, for example, that LPTA is still of concern, lowest price technically acceptable as a means of contracting is still of concern to a lot of people. Policy on that hasn't changed. It has not been a lot of emphasis under 3.0, but we're aware of those concerns. We'll continue to work them. So that's, that's the short version on 2.0. Let me move on to 3.0 now. There's a lot on this chart, as uh, John kind of indicated earlier on. Uh, I'm going to try and pe peel back the onion a little bit for you, uh, starting with sort of the bumper stickers at the top and the bottom. Achieving dominant capabilities through technical excellence and innovation. Okay, the thrust of this version of, of better buying power is about that. The thrust last time was about critical thinking and tools to help our people make better decisions as they did business deals, planned and executed programs, contracted for and acquired services and oversaw that work. It was about decision making and better tools and critical thinking and professionalism. The earliest version of better buying power, the one Dr. Carter and I did, was largely about best practices. So there's been an evolution over these three, and this one brings us back to our products, to the capabilities that we're giving to the warfighters. So it is focused on those dominant capabilities uh, and the importance of technical excellence and innovation to acquiring them. Now this goes hand in hand with what the Secretary of Defense and the Deputy Secretary of Defense and I and others have been saying for some time now, is that our technological superiority is at risk. It is eroding uh, because we're not making the investments we should be making. Uh, John mentioned sequestration, the threat of sequestration, even the cuts to the level we've already taken them pose problems for us in terms of maintaining technological superiority. And that's one of the things behind this thrust and this vis vis version of better buying power towards that end of the spectrum, towards the products that we're providing and how well we're doing it, providing the right kinds of products. The other, bottom, the other bumper sticker up here is at the bottom of the chart, and it's continued strengthening our culture of cost consciousness, professionalism, and technical excellence. And those summarize, if you will, the three editions of better buying power. The first one is focused in large part on cost consciousness and things we could do to control cost. The second one added professionalism to the list because the professionalism of our people is the most important factor in terms of getting good results. 
and then technical excellence, the centerpiece of getting dominant capabilities to the battlefield, which characterizes 3.0. So those three things are all about who we are and what we do. And they're central to the whole concept of better buying power and what the department tries to do in ATNL. Now, if you go back one more layer on the chart, there are a number of major categories here. These are essentially unchanged from Better Buying Power 2.0. These are the areas of focus writ large. Affordable programs, dominant capabilities while controlling life cycle cost, incentivizing productivity, incentivizing innovation, in eliminating unproductive processes and bureaucracy, promoting effective competition, improving tradecraft and acquisition of services, and improving professionalism within our total acquisition workforce. The, those are the main areas we continue to focus on. There have been some minor changes in the wording of some of these, but they're essentially the same as the ones that we had last time with some slight shifts in emphasis. So let me now walk you through this quickly and talk to you a little bit about each of these. Under the first category, continue to set and enforce affordability caps. We've been doing this for about four years now. We've been reasonably successful. Uh, almost all of our programs have stayed within their caps. We have two or three that are just marginally above them, and we have to go address those. Uh, and we have a couple that have a few percent increase, then we have to go address those as well. This has provided some discipline for our acquisition process. It's very important that we continue this. It's very important that we enforce the caps we are putting in place. I just saw an, an analysis uh, by a former colleague, Dave McNichol at IDA. And the analysis was of the implications of tight budgets for program performance. And as we've done a lot of correlations, Phil Anton and his team have done a lot of correlations of different things and how they affect the acquisition outcomes, in particular costs and schedule uh, problems. One of the things we did not think to look at was budget climate, and we should have looked at it. Because in tight budget climate, people's behavior changes, and that's what's behind all of our results. Dave McNichol's work shows very clearly that in tight budget times, we take risk. Industry takes risk in their bidding because there are a few things to go after. People who do budgets and do programs take risk because they try to cram more in, and they force people like program managers and acquisition leaders and others to cut corners and make assumptions that turn out not to be true. And that's how you end up with overruns and schedule slips. It's a very strong correlation. You may have noticed that we're in a tight budget time right now. So it makes it incredibly important for us to continue to set and enforce meaningful affordability caps, but also to make sure we have realistic program plans as we go forward. The next chart in that major category is the dominant capabilities while controlling life cycle cost. Some of the uh, items, and this first one is an example of that, that are in better buying power, are core items, if you will. They are central to what we're trying to do, and they would probably be, and I expect will be in any, any version of better buying power. And this is one of them, the idea of should cost. The idea that our managers are responsible for understanding their cost structure, examining it, finding opportunities to reduce costs, setting targets for themselves and going after those targets, trying to achieve them. We've implemented this very well across the department over the last four years. We're continuing to emphasize it. Uh, all of our program managers, all of our people who manage money have an obligation to do this. And it's a big part of changing who the, how we think about money. It's not our duty to spend the money and get it out the door. It's our duty to control our costs and save money wherever we can and get more value for the taxpayer. So that's a core item under better buying power. Building stronger partnerships between acquisition requirements and adding, in this version, intelligence communities. We have to be better at responding to threats. We have to understand the threats. We have to incorporate that knowledge into our programs and then make adjustments. And that requires a stronger partnership with the intelligence community. We don't just get a threat document at the beginning of a program. We have a continuing relationship. Uh, we need to make some more progress. We have some good things in place there, but we need to do more. The next one is, uh, carries that theme forward, anticipate and plan for responsive and emerging threats. I've had the experience many years ago of a program manager who came in and said that we shouldn't cancel his program because he had met his requirement, his requirement being the threat that existed at the time we started the, started the program. But over time, the threat had changed. It had improved its capability to where his, his system that he was developing would no longer be effective. He seemed to think for some reason that because he had met his initial requirement, we should still go ahead and produce and put in the field his, his product. We did not. Okay. You have to be aware of uh, response to threats. You have to plan for them. You have to think about them ahead of time uh, and anticipate what our adversaries may do. We do have active uh, potential adversaries out there now who are designing things to defeat us and who are paying attention to what we're doing and thinking ahead about what they need to do to counter our emerging systems. Uh, there are also emerging threats that may not be fielded yet, but we know they're coming. Uh, we have evidence that they're coming. It's a little different than a response to threat. 
Uh, we have to take both of these into account as we plan our programs. Institutionalize stronger DOD level long range R&D planning. Uh, this is something the deputy has asked me to do, Deputy Secretary of Work. Uh, we have done some strategic planning, if you will, for our research and development uh, investments, largely focused on specific technology areas that we think are strategic and we've identified. This is going to take it a step further. This is modeled after, after something that was done in the 70s. Uh, it was a combined industry and government activity at the time. We've asked Steve Welby, who was our lead system engineer, to lead this. Uh, it'll be overseen by myself, uh, Katrina, Al Schaefer, and uh, Arthi Prabhakar from DARPA, and a few other people. But it's modeled after that earlier activity, and it will be designed to set out the next few years of high priority R&D to get us to a position where we'll have technologies we can take into game-changing systems. Uh, the, if you look back to the, the study that I referred to that was done in the 70s, a lot of the capability we have today came out of that study. Things like smart weapons, smart seekers, uh, some of our networking technologies and other things. Things that have dominated, allowed us to dominate in the battlefield for quite a long time now. The idea is to get to the next generation of those things, find out what they are, do it in a coherent way, and then focus our resources on programs that are going to change the game. Uh, if, we, if we don't do that, the concern I had about technological superiority is going to become even, even greater. Uh, the next broad category, incentivizing productivity, uh, aligning profitability more tightly with our department goals. This is, not, this is another core uh, item under 3.0, under better buying power in general. We, had, we, as the last report we put out shows, we do a reasonably good job of aligning our, our, our the industry's opportunity to make a profit with the results that we expect. We don't always get it perfectly, and I think in general we can do better. And one thing we can do better is to provide greater incentives to innovation. Uh, we can provide incentives, obviously, to, to, to performance, you know, cost and schedule performance and meeting existing requirements. We want to go beyond that. So this will be a continued area of, <coughs> of emphasis. Uh, again, one that would be under any version of better buying power. Uh, same is true with the next one, increasing appropriate, uh, use appropriate contract types. Uh, we're modifying this one kind of as we go, as we learn. And this is an area where our analysis has shown us that incentive type contracts, formulaic incentives we call them, where possibilities for uh, cost increases or, or savings are shared between industry and the government are very effective at getting results. You can set those arrangements up a wide variety of ways, but these seem to be the best forms of contracting for many of the things we do. Uh, that's true, and, in, and incidentally, it's true of cost plus incentive and fixed price incentive. And actually, there is a stronger correlation to using the incentives in our results than the risk to whether it's a cost plus or a fixed price contract. So we're going to continue to emphasize that. Uh, that's a slight shift as we've gone through 1.0, the 2.0 to 3.0, and as we've learned from, from the actual data about what works and what doesn't. Expand the superior supplier incentive program across DOD. The Navy rolled out its pilot program uh, a few months ago, and we're instituting that in the other services this year, uh, this, this going into the next fiscal year. The, the idea here is to let industry know how it's doing, uh, how it's doing relative to its competitors and its, and its peers in the, in the, in the, in the industrial base. Uh, I think we'll benefit from this. I think industry will benefit from this. I think it's important for shareholders to know how their companies are doing. Uh, I think it's important for boards to know. I think it's important for managers to know. Uh, then you can react. I had, uh, after we published, the Navy published its list, I had a CEO come in to me and say that because we had published a list and one of his business units was in the bottom third of the three you know, segments, he had to go explain to his board why he was in the bottom third and what he was going to do to improve. I thought, this is terrific. This is exactly what I want to see because of this. Uh, we're going to continue to do that. We're going to do it by service and not at the DOD level. A lot of the business units that we're evaluating or that we're, we're assessing uh, exist more in line with service needs, so it's probably the right level. And we're going to do it by the major P&L centers in the, in the contractors, which I think is the entity where people have profit and loss re responsibility and can control their performance uh, best. And that'll give insight to more senior people in the companies uh, it'll give us insight, and I think it'll provide a strong incentive to industry. We are, of course, looking for benefits that we can provide, and we're working with the companies in particular that are at the top tier of those three tiers to find ways to, to, uh, to, to have a, a benefit for being at the top, as well as you know, the, the concern about where you are if you're at the bottom. Um, <laughs> increase the effective use of performance-based logistics. This is a carryover from 2.0. 
Uh, we've made some progress on this. We've gotten out some good guidance, I think, to our workforce. We're getting good training out. However, we're not improving our performance in this area as much as I'd like to see. We're not doing more PBL-type contracting. I think that's in large part because of the uh, difficult year we had in 13, uh, between sequestration and furloughs and everything else. The workload on our contracting people in particular was, was pretty, pretty excessive. Uh, but it's a harder way to do a contract. It takes a little bit more work uh, than some of the other more straightforward ways, but it gets results, and we need to do more of it. So we're going to continue to emphasize PBL. Remove the barriers to commercial technology utilization. This is a new item, and it's an item where we have our own work to do, and we're going to work, out, work with industry on this to find ways to do this. We think there are a lot of opportunities there. Uh, this is one of the items on 3.0 where we're going to put a team together, we're going to work with industry, and we're going to go develop specific things to implement this, this broad goal. Uh, technology, of course, in, in a number of commercial areas moves much more quickly than military areas. We want to take advantage of that. We want to find a way to bring innovators who are in the commercial world, uh, give them a reason to be uh, involved with the government and do business with the government. So we're going to try to improve our performance there. And we're open to ideas on that. While I'm on that subject, uh, another key thing on the chart overall that I should have mentioned is that this is a draft. Um, I'm, I'm briefing it today. We're going to go around talking to a lot of people about this. But this isn't the final version of 3.0. There's not going to be a 3.1 point, whatever it was that John said, 3.1.26. There will be another uh, final version of 3.0. This is the same process we used for the earlier versions. Basically, we put it out, we get feedback from stakeholders on the Hill and think tanks and in industry, particularly in industry, uh, and then we modify it and then we develop implementing instruction. So in about the January time frame, we'll have gone through that process and we'll put out the final version with implementing instructions. So I'm introducing it today as the start of that uh, comment and uh, dialogue that we need to have as we finalize this and we figure out exactly what we're gonna do on some of these areas. So we're very open to ideas. Uh, to, to modify this or to help us go in the right direction as we implement it. Uh, the next one is improve the return on investment in DOD laboratories. About $30 billion a year, give or take, goes through our DOD laboratories. That's a lot. It's not all R&D money per se, and some of it's from work for others, uh, but it's a pretty significant amount of cash flow, and we need to get as much of a return on that as possible. This is not a new subject. A lot of uh, pre previous studies have looked at this. But I think it's worth our while to go take a look again and see if we can improve the productivity and the efficiency of our DOD laboratories. They're a significant part of what we do in the R&D world. The next bullet is similar. It's on IRAD, internal research and development that companies do, and on contracted R&D that, that, we, that we provide the funding for and do under contract. The government pays for both of these uh, bodies of research. And what I mean by contracted R&D in this case in particular is 6-1 through 6-4 parts of the budget. Uh, stuff before we get into full-scale development of an actual product or, or that's different from the upgrade of an existing product. It's the earlier stage research, if you will, both the S&T research and then uh, the, the, the more advanced concepts research that follows after that before you go into a uh, EMD program. We're going to look hard at this work. I've, I've, we've done some things on IRAD in particular already under earlier visions of better, versions of better buying power. Uh, we've, we've improved our ability to communicate with industry. We have a better understanding of what industry is doing. They have better access to what the government is doing with our funded R&D and our in-house R&D. Uh, we want to go a step further with this and start looking at what we're actually getting out of this, both of these uh, pots of money. The first one, IRAD, is about four to four and a half billion dollars a year, and CRAD is somewhere in the neighborhood of $10 billion a year. You know, that's a significant amount of money. Our total R&D budget right now is running about $60 billion. So you can see that we're talking about a fairly significant fraction here. Uh, the next one is incentivize innovation in industry and government. It begins with one on prototyping and experimentation. When, when budgets are tight, there's an opportunity to do things that are not full-scale development, not really preparing products uh, for production, which is very expensive, but to build prototypes and to do operational experimentation with those prototypes. It's very hard in the current budget climate, I can tell you, to get those sorts of things funded because they're not necessarily or definitely going to lead to a product or a capability in the hands of the warfighter. But there's a lot you get out of this. You move technology forward. For a relatively small amount of money, you advance technology, you advance the state of the art in the direction you want to go by a significant amount. You reduce lead time by several years, perhaps, to having that technology in an actual product. You help your industrial base. You keep your design teams alive. So if you're not doing full-scale development, you're at least giving them a chance to build something and be creative and hone those skill sets on a, on a product level basis. 
and you position yourself in case something happens that changes the situation. If the threat increases, uh, if funds are, more funds are available, then you can move much more quickly into an actual product. So there are a lot of good reasons to do prototyping and experimentation. The problem is finding the money to do it. I'm going to be proposing some of these in the budget process this fall, and we'll see how it goes. I was able to get some things funded last year. Uh, I think Secretary of Work and the Secretary of Defense, Secretary Hagel, are both very much in line with my thinking on this. But there's going to be something we won't do if we do these prototypes and do this experimentation. And that's going to be the difficult discussion we're going to have to have as we get into our process. Uh, emphasize technology insertion and refresh in program planning. Uh, we do this to a degree already. We can be better at it. Uh, this is closely tied to the next item about modular open systems. The F-35, for example, has, has, is on its second refresh cycle now. I can envision a third one easily uh, before high rate, full rate production. The, the technology in certain areas, electronics in particular, is moving much more quickly than the length of time it takes us to develop a major weapon system. And we need to be planning for that and being able to be able to insert those technologies in. Which leads me to the next uh, item, which is open systems architectures. Again, this was in 2.0. This is not new. We have put out some better guidance on this, I think, for our workforce. We're going to be looking very carefully at our product designs to ensure that as much as we can, as much as is economically viable, we design for open systems. That's particularly true for uh, software as well as for hardware. It, it, it's, I, I was in industry for a long time. I understand how industry works and things, and how, I understand how attractive it is uh, to retain control of a product once you've filled it. So you can do the upgrades and make sure that you're involved in them. But that doesn't get us the competition that we need here. So we need to work with industry to make sure we have open systems that are actually effective and can actually be used to upgrade programs as technology matures and to do it as much as possible in a competitive environment. Uh, increase the return on small business innovation research. This is a good program. Uh, it's been very successful. We've done a lot there. The, 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 the problem I want to address here is the transition of small business innovative research funded projects into products, into fielded, developed actual products. Uh, I think we can do better there. And we may be able to expand that program. I don't know if we can, but I'm sure that we can do a better job of doing transition. Provide technical, draft technical requirements to industry early and involve industry in uh, funded concept definition. This is the earlier stages of product development. And it gives us a chance to interact with industry. I, I really encourage our people to work with industry and get industry's ideas. Obviously, industry has their own interests uh, in mind in many cases when they provide us with things. But that doesn't mean they're bad ideas. Uh, they can be very good ideas. And we need to be open and have that dialogue and get industry more engaged. The study that I mentioned that was done in the 70s uh, was led by Don Hicks, one of my former bosses in the Pentagon, the integration group for that study. But when he led it, he was in industry. He wasn't in government. It was before he came into government. And at that time, we could very easily just reach out, grab smart people from industry, put them on a panel together with government people, and go do a study like that. We're not allowed to do that anymore. Uh, the rules today don't, don't permit that. But we can still find ways within the rules to have dialogue with industry. One of the ways to do that is let them know, in this case, uh, this initiative, as early as possible, what our requirements are. So we get feedback from them on that. If they think our requirements are unreasonable for some reason, we need to know that. We need to understand it. Uh, if they think that they could be even more uh, uh, effective, we could have more stringent requirements or better performance requirements, and that they can support that. We need to know that, too. And then industry needs to know so they can make their own investments in terms of trying to fulfill our requirements and positioning themselves. The funded concept definition piece is about taking some money, low, not, not very much money, and some time early on in parallel with our analysis of alternatives activities to ask industry to do some early design trade-offs and trade studies, do some operational analysis. This allows us to get inputs from industry in a, in a structured way. It's done in a competitive environment. Industry has to be willing to share with us things that we can then use to put into requirements but if your, your concept is the one that looks most attractive to us, and we use that as a basis for our requirements, then that puts you in a very good position. So there's an attractive reason for industry to do this with us. We'll open up our, our aperture uh, to the, all, the, all the good work, ideas, all the smart people that are out there thinking about how to solve our problems for us. Uh, all, the, all the knowledge about the exact requirements and all the, of technology do not reside in government. We need to tap into industry more effectively than we have been. Uh, provide clear best value definitions so industry can propose and DOD can choose wisely. 
we're doing this already. Uh, we've done it on a little a pilot basis, essentially, but we're doing it more and more broadly. The idea here is that we need to give industry a reason to bid higher performance to us if they think it would be attractive to us in a product. The reason meaning that you'll get selected in the source selection process. The way we've been doing this for a very long time now is we put out requirements that have an objective level and a threshold level. An objective level is what we'd sort of like to have if it were possible and we could afford it. The threshold level is what we really want to have. It's sort of our minimum that we want to have in the product. Industry bids to the threshold levels, and nobody expects otherwise, because that's generally going to be cheaper. And unless there's some way to get credit for being above that level, there's no reason to bid above that level. The idea here is we will tell industry what it's performance. We'll pay another, let's just say, 10% if you get us to the higher level performance. Or we'll pay another 30% if you get us to the higher level performance. Now, you still have to be below our overall affordability cap. Bid something that's better than the minimum that they're going to have a better chance of winning and getting the contract. Which at the end of the day, that's what it's about from the industry side, is do you get the contract or not? So there's an incentive to achieve those levels and give us a better value product. Okay, the next major category, unproductive processes and bureaucracy. This will always be in better buying power also. It's a constant struggle. Uh, it never goes away. Uh, we've made some progress there, but I think there's more to be done. Uh, we want to continue to emphasize the chain of command. A lot of the bureaucracy that is, is imposed on us and imposed within the services as well as from OSD comes from other people who are not in the chain of command, who are stakeholders of some type, who want to have, make sure their interest is protected. Uh, that's, that's valid. That's a reasonable thing for them to want to do. But it also imposes a big burden in many cases on the chain of command itself. So we want strong relationship with the requirements people in particular. And we want to work with them as we go uh, forward and through the life cycle of our products. But we, we want our chain of command to be empowered to do the job it's been given to do. And that is a large part of what removing the burden uh, that, that they face is what this is all about. And we're doing our best to do this in OSD. Uh, again, though, it's a continuous struggle. Uh, we have an initiative with uh, industry that Katrina McFarland, McFarland is, is leading to look at some of the burdens that we're placing on, on our contractors through the way we do business. Uh, that's well underway. It was part of uh, what we were doing under 2.0, and it'll wrap up in the next few months. So we're continuing to look at that level as well. Uh, we're trying to reduce cycle time while ensuring sound investments. That means we don't want to take excessive risk. We want to look for ways to actually get cycle time down without creating excessive risk. Uh, I have been asked by uh, uh, some of the people on the operational side of the house about why the acquisition system takes too long. It isn't the oversight of the acquisition system that's slowing down our programs. The decisions get made, they generally get made on time, uh, even though there's a burdensome staffing process to go through to get that. What slows down our programs is not getting the work done, uh, not fulfilling the requirements, not, not getting the design finished, not getting the test done, not actually building the product on time. Uh, that's where we got to focus if we're going to reduce cycle times. Streamline documentation, though, we'll continue to do that. Uh, I have a general principle that documents should have utility, uh, not just be something that we inspect and then gets thrown away after you've met my inspection requirements. They should be a, a plan that we get into OSD to review for a service program, should be the actual plan that will be implemented and used as a management document by the program office. That's the goal we're still striving for. I don't think we're there yet, and we're gonna to continue to emphasize that. Uh, the next one is another core uh, item, competition. Create and maintain competitive environments is a continuation from uh, 2.0. Competition is our best way, of course, to reduce prices, but we can't always have competition. We're a low-volume specialty product buyer for the most part, and we generally cannot afford competition in production. We can afford competition leading up to a decision to enter EMD. Occasionally, we can carry competition through EMD, and very rarely can we have competition in production, which means we've got to find other ways to do it. And that's what this initiative tends to focus us on. It's the idea of creating a competitive environment, giving people a reason to worry about losing their business and, and emphasize uh, that performance is what's going to help you keep your business, better performance. So that's the idea behind that. It, again, it's a core value. We're just going to continue to hammer on that. You can do a lot, of course, at subsystem and component levels. Uh, you can do a lot in the services contracting area, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Environment existence out there. Uh, improve our technology search and outreach in global markets. 
This one gets at the need to, to not be so um, closed. We have a lot of very capable partners in the world, a lot of other countries who do good work, and we're looking for opportunities to co-develop uh, and do sharing of the burden of uh, developing a new product and then, and then uh, better scales, economic scale production once we get into production. And so we're looking at a broader at technologies. I mentioned earlier we're looking at commercial technologies. This expands that even further and talks about global opportunities. Acquisition of services. Uh, because we spend as much money on services as we do on products, this is also going to remain a core part of uh, better buying power. It's also something that we still have a lot of work to do on. Uh, we've put some things in place to manage our services acquisition. Uh, we're doing better, uh, but I'm convinced, and Alan, who's got the lead on this for me, is convinced that there's more money to be saved here. Uh, more productivity gains to be made, more efficiency to be found. A piece of that is this first bullet, which is about small businesses. This is one of the best areas for small businesses to get involved with in the department. They bring a lot to the table. Uh, they're often leaner, have lower overheads. Uh, are hungry and can provide us with services uh, much more effectively and efficiently than, than large businesses can. Uh, key to that is market research, the item in the first bullet, understanding what's out there, understanding what's available. Again, we've made progress, but there's more that we can do. Strengthening contract management outside the normal acquisition chain. We focus enormously in this town on our products, the major programs in particular. Uh, there are products, obviously, at lower tiers that are important to us. There's an enormous amount of money there. But in this case, we're talking about services contracting. And people who buy support for installations, for example, people who buy maintenance services, people who buy IT services. There are a number of areas in which people are spending money, and we need to focus on best practices in each of those areas and improve our capabilities there. Um, <clears throat> improving requirements definition. One of the critical things we found, this is another carryover that we're continuing, one of the critical things we found to having a successful services contract and getting good value for your money is that you write the requirements well. This enables people to bid well, it enables people to understand what you really need, and it enables us to get a better business deal where the product and the performance we want is well defined. So that's one area of continued focus under services. Uh, the next item is new. It's about improving effectiveness and productivity of contracted engineering and technical services. That's consistent with the theme of this version of better buying power, and it's focusing us on what we do in CETA contracts, for example, we're hiring technical expertise. We're bringing people in to help us and do services of this nature for the government. Uh, we spend a fair amount of money here, and I think we can uh, be more productive in how the return we're getting on that as well. We're looking for ideas on that. Okay, the last major category is improving professionalism. Uh, I, 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 I do not maintain that we have an unprofessional workforce. We have a very professional workforce. I'm very proud of it. Uh, we have terrific people. They went through a nightmare year in 13. Uh, and they came through it with a great deal of resilience. It's a great team. But every single member of that team, including myself, can improve his professionalism. So we're going to continue to harp on that and continue to find ways to, to make that happen. Uh, part of that is establishing higher standards uh, for our key leadership positions. That's well underway. We're going to have that in place by the end of the next year or so. We're establishing stronger professional qualification requirements for all our specialties in acquisition. And that's well underway also. Uh, and the key leadership positions, uh, Dave Brown, who's my chief tester, uh, developmental test and evaluation lead, has instituted a certification board, if you will, for our top leadership positions in the testing area for that career field. That's a pilot. We're looking at uh, whether we're going to do that for some of the other career fields as well. And it's about building the, uh, the culture of professionalism and the idea that, and it's true, that all of these professions are that. They are very specialized uh, bodies of work with a great deal of uh, knowledge and experience is required to do them well. Strengthen our organic engineering capabilities. I think our organic engineering capabilities in some cases, we can't be good customers if we don't have the right technical capabilities in-house. So we're going to look at uh, ways to do that. That's another area where we could use some help. Part of that may be more exchanges with industry for our technical people. Uh, more careful management of the career fields of technical people. And certainly emphasizing the importance of technical people to our success. Ensure the DOD leadership for development programs is technically qualified to manage R&D activities. This is a bit of a shift. Uh, there's a, some people have the idea, which I think is not correct, that if you're a good manager and a good leader, you can run anything. I don't believe that that is true. I would not take a group of trial lawyers who are doing litigation and ask someone who is a good manager and a good leader, but not a lawyer, to supervise that group of people as they did their work. I would not ask. Uh, a person who was not a physician or a surgeon to supervise a group of doctors who were surgeons 
as they did their work in doing their work. And I would not ask someone who is not an engineer to run a development program where the fundamental job you're doing is engineering. I just think that that's a recipe for, for failure. And I have seen some examples of that. You need to understand what you're doing if you're gonna supervise it effectively. And so I'm pushing us towards a stronger line. Some of the services are in pretty good shape on this, others are not. And I think we need to emphasize this as we go through our, our selection of people for some of our key jobs. So that'll be a, a big part of that. And I think that the services need to really recognize the criticality of those kinds of professionals, those kinds of qualified leaders and managers for their development programs, which is where we tend to get in trouble in our programs. Um, consistent with that and kind of as a corollary to that is the next item, improve our leaders' ability to understand and mitigate technical risk. This, this one came out of an experience of my last few years where I've seen a lot of people come in with, and talk about risk. And what I, my, my perception is that what they are doing is not managing risk, they're watching it. They've identified it, they see it, they know that if certain things go right, things will be better and there'll be less of it. So they're watching it. They, under, they understand it to that level. They're not managing it. Managing it is about doing things to change the nature of that risk and reduce it earlier than it would be otherwise. It's about things like carrying backups. It's about carrying two sources. Uh, it's about any number of things you can do. Early testing and key things. How you structure your program. There are a lot of things that we should be doing to and We're gonna look at that hard and try to make sure our people can do a good job of that. It's a critical part of what we do. The product development cycle is essentially a risk management process. You begin by defining requirements which you think are achievable. You understand the risk of getting to those requirements. You identify risk mitigation activities you need to do before you commit to design for production. You do those, so you have those things accomplished early. And then you commit to a development program, uh, which is all about getting out the risk of building the product, finalizing the design, and then you test. Again, you're reducing risk. So it's all about risk management. We need to be, we need to be very expert at that, at that skill. Um, the next bullet is one that I put in because of my long-term concern for the health of both DOD and our nation. And it's to, it's to uh, increase our level of support for science, technology, engineering, and math education. A lot of uh, the defense industrial base uh, is involved in this, and I really, mostly on a voluntary basis, and I really applaud what they're doing. We're going to try to do as much as we can from the DOD perspective. You know, our economic well being, our economic competitiveness, and our military competitiveness, and our technological superiority all depend upon the science, technology, engineering, and math basis that we have to build the products that we need. So we're going to, it's long term, it's not an immediate return, but in terms of things that are going to be different 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years down the road, we have got the strength of uh, this part of what we do as a society, frankly. Okay, that's, that's the list. I think I've left myself a little bit of time, I hope, for questions. So thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, let me uh, uh, first uh, uh, apologize to our web audience. Uh, we had a cutout of the web feed and uh, should be back up now, but I want to make sure you know that the entire video will be posted online afterwards. So anybody who didn't catch it first time will get to come watch it again. Great. Uh, we have Are three you ways you can ask you questions. To, yeah. Yeah. Um, one is, uh, is, in fact, uh, we'll do our normal system of you raise your hand. Uh, Mr. Kendall will recognize you. Somebody will bring you a microphone, you stand up, identify yourself and your affiliation, and you can ask your question. Uh, the second is we have cards. This is particularly useful if you don't want him to know who's asking the question. Um, and, uh, and we already have a number of these, so I'm actually gonna, gonna pass these up to you and you can start uh, looking at them. Uh, the third is if you're watching on the web, you can email your questions uh, to dberteau, D-B-E-R-T-E-A-U, at CSIS.org, and actually a number of these have already come in uh, from the web. So those are the three ways in which you can get it. I'll leave it up to you to determine when to go back and forth between the, the paper and the audience. Okay. Uh, I, I see a couple of hands. Let me do kind of one and one than the other. I will alternate. The first one is you want to push affordability, but you want some big bets on technology for offsets. How do these two goals fit together? Won't the big bets cost too much uh, with too little guaranteed benefit? Um, I, you have to reconcile these competing requirements, right? Affordability is about, uh, we don't establish affordability goals till we enter engineering manufacturing development. We do, we do targets earlier than that uh, to influence the requirements trade-offs that happen early. And then as we get to milestone B, the commitment to EMD, 
Uh, we then put a cap in place, which is basically the cap. Okay, it's not a, it's not a target or goal, it's the cap. That's what you have to design to, it's have to, have to stay under. Uh, that allows us to keep our, our programs within, uh, within the reach of our, within our grasp. The, um, the, the analysis behind this is long-term capital planning analysis. You look out the life cycle of the product, 30 years roughly, uh, and you look at your expected future budgets and you analyze whether or not this will fit in your portfolio given all the other things you have to do. And from that you can derive the production cap and you can derive the supportability cap. So they're not cost estimates, they're caps based on future budgets. They're, they're very different from cost estimates. Once you have the cap, then you have to ensure that your cost estimate for the actual product you want to buy is under that cap. And you have to design to that, so it's a design constraint. So that, that's really m implemented more as we get into product development. The, there are two kinds of bets we're talking, and we are talking about technology offsets, basically. There's, there are early stage uh, technology maturation and experimentation, some of the prototyping I talk about, which is a relatively small bet. But then there are places where you make the major commitment to a new system, a new product. Uh, we, we want to get all of this right. But in the earlier stages, you have a chance to learn and make some decisions about what will really work on future battlefields. And that can be done relatively inexpensively if you set aside the money to do it. So that's how that part of the, uh, the equation works. Um, the guaranteed benefit, uh, we have no choice. Uh, we can be complacent and, and sit and wait. We have to make decisions about how to use our resources in some way to stay ahead of the other guys. It's a competition. Uh, it's become a more intense competition over the last 10 or 15 years, I think. So we, we have no choice. We have to figure out what's going to make sense, and we have to do it. And in some cases, we have to overcome some significant inertia. Uh, and I can go on and on about that. Uh, so we need to work closely with, the, as, I, as I mentioned, the requirements community and the intelligence community as we try to figure out what the best way forward is. Uh, so I'll stop there. Okay, this one right here. In the front. Thank you, sir. Zach Biggs with Jane's. Um, one of the things you talked about was accessing commercial technology. Is what? I'm sorry. Accessing. A couple of years ago, the department was pushing Congress to limit commercial of a type uh, within the confines of acquisition. I think in response to the LCS, the presidential helicopter, to a couple of areas where there were problems. Um, given that that's a tool that does allow for access of commercial technology, is that being rethought? Is there still uh, a concern about how commercial of a type is being used? And do you think there are other areas that might need to be modified as far as uh, acquiring commercial technology to make sure that you can get to that technology? Uh, it's a good question. There are really two different subjects in there, but they're related. Um, what I'm trying to do is make it more attractive for commercial companies to do business with us, uh, find uh, avenues by which we can bring commercial technologies in more easily. There are things like uh, other transaction authorities we could use, for example, to do that. DARPA does that very effectively. The, the commercial type issue is about our purchasing practices. And when we buy products that are commercial products uh, that are sold in the marketplace competitively, we essentially pay commercial prices. And we don't, we don't inquire into the cost of those. Uh, uh, we don't get background data. We certainly don't get certified cost and pricing. We basically say that the marketplace has worked and has, affected a has gotten us a price. If we're a volume buyer, then we try to get discounts, of course, uh, which is what any commercial buyer would do. But we don't make further inquiries. Then if, there, if we do a unique military product on a sole source basis particularly, we look at the cost structure. Now, we have an obligation to protect the taxpayer's interest here. Uh, one of the things we have to do as a government is ensure that uh, we're, we don't uh, pay excessive prices for things. And every now and then we do that, we make a mistake, and we get you know, a lot of publicity about it. So we have an obligation to do that, and it's what the taxpayers expect us to do. So for things that are unique to the military, we have a lot of uh, things we do with industry to ensure that we look at their cost. And in some cases, we get certified cost. Uh, then there are things that are kind of in between, and that's where the commercial of a type comes in. It's a product that is uh, derived from, and close to, perhaps, a commercial product, but it's not exactly the same. So then we can do a lot of things. We, we, we want to put as little burden on the purchasing process as possible, but at the same time, we want to make sure we're getting a fair and reasonable price. So we ask industry to give us information that'll, that will tell us somehow that it's a fair and reasonable price. So the, the guidance we have to our people right now is essentially that. It, it leaves open the possibility of asking for certified price data, but it, the preference is for something much less than that, something that is adequate to us. 
And so we, we're looking at that now. There have been some issues that have come up. I'm working with Dick and Shay Assad, Dick Jimin and Shay Assad on this. I want to make sure our policy is as clear as it can be, that it balances the goals of making it possible for us to get commercial and commercial-like products into the government as efficiently as possible. We don't want to drive away commercial suppliers. I, mean, I mentioned barriers to entry, right? So we don't want people to be refusing to do business with the government because we've imposed onerous or unacceptable requirements on them. And at the same time, you want to protect the taxpayer's interest. So we have to find a way to balance those two sometimes competing goals. Now, I'll mention this just to, to, to wrap this up. We all buy commercial parts all the time. I don't think we hurt any of us as, in, as, as individual consumers. How often do you inquire into what it costs to make the product? We don't care about that. We generally do not care about that. We care about what it's worth to us. We care about its value to us. And so, you know, if we're buying a car, you know, we don't care. Well, we might care. We might be slightly interested. But we think that the commercial marketplace that we're in is fairly setting the price, that car companies are in competition with each other. So we don't inquire into the cost. And it turns out that the margins getting, uh, on most cars anyway, are pretty small. What about when you buy parts? What do you think the markup is on the parts you buy for your car? I can tell you it's a lot more, okay? And that's how car companies are often really making it, those genuine whatever parts, right? Um, as a consumer, you sort of just accept that, right? But I'm, when I'm buying parts for the U.S. government with U.S. taxpayer money, I don't want to pay factors of three or four for those parts compared to what they cost. So that's the problem that we have. That's the dilemma. We're not quite like consumers because we have a different responsibility. Uh, commercial companies who are making those parts really don't want right? There's a reason, business reason why they do it. There's a business reason why it's structured the way it is. But you know, our, our, it works in the commercial world pretty well. There's a little different uh, requirement for us as, as buyers for the U.S. taxpayers. Okay. All right, next one is here. What, uh, what ideas do you have to change the culture from I need to build it from scratch versus buying it commercially? Uh, the problem is that an awful lot of our products are not available commercially. All our weapon systems are not commercially available, for the most part. There are a few exceptions. The, uh, we've done this in, uh, we, we essentially use a commercial model in a couple of cases I can mention. One is uh, tactical radios. We had a program called Jitters that went on for a very long time. It was, a, it was cutting edge technology to do software defined radios basically for tactical use. And there was a, for families of them. A lot of you in the room I know are familiar with these radios. And we realized a couple of years ago that while we've been going through the government process of developing all this, industry had realized what our requirements had been, and a number of companies had decided on their own to go ahead and develop products essentially on their own, and then to offer them to us. That's the commercial model. Uh, the military model is we pay for the R&D, we reimburse you as you go for the R&D, and then we pay you for the production as you go, and you, you give the product to us. The commercial model is do the R&D yourself at your own expense, borrow money, you know, sell stock, do whatever, uh, get capital yourself, do the R&D, and then put it on the market for people to buy. Uh, that's not the way we do it, and I think it's very rare uh, if for most of the things we buy that that would be an appropriate bottle for the military. It takes too long to get our products into production, and the return's too uncertain. There are some exceptions, and the radios are one, where people saw a return, and they made investments, and they have products that we can now go out and do what is essentially a, a source selection among products that are already developed. Our culture wasn't ready for that. Um, when we started to do this, there were people who wanted to do all the usual things we do with a normal product. And we had to say, wait a minute, this is not, you know, we don't need to do two years of developmental testing. It's developed, that's done. We do need to do qualification testing to see if it meets our requirements. And if it does, we're gonna accept it and then we're gonna, uh, as long as it's, you know, uh, competitive. Uh, the other example I have is in the space launch area where people have made investments on their own to develop space launch capabilities. And there are a couple of companies doing this. Uh, I'm not gonna name some companies, but I think it's in everybody's minds, a couple of them anyway. Um, and that's provided an opportunity for us. That created, interestingly, a competitive environment, the thing I talked about uh, in the slide, where the government's uh, normal source reacted very strongly to the uh, arrival, or the pending arrival, in this case, it hadn't arrived yet, of competition. And we got a substantial reduction in cost. And there's a lot of, I think, very healthy behavior happening out there right now in the space launch area, as far as the government's concerned, uh, because of the fact that we're introducing competition. We want to have as much of it as we can, as soon as we can, because it's, it's going to work for us. Okay, next the audience, right here. Yeah. While we're waiting for the mic, I'm gonna give you a couple of anonymous uh, questions that have come in here. 
stood up for George Washington University. That's good. But first, I really want to applaud you and your office for the two annual performance assessment reports. I think they're tremendously important. I hope you stick with that. We will. My question is more about at what point will you evolve from the performance assessment with a focus on process as opposed to outcome? So I loved your example earlier where you talked about the program manager who had met the original goal, but you still cancel the program. So at what point do you start focusing on instead of purchase price, life cycle cost or bang for the buck, and then at what point do we start looking at things like end user customer satisfaction, because we know that past performance isn't really measuring what matters to you as a consumer. Uh, good point. The, the report has not dealt with support costs so far, and we need to get that in there. We need to start analyzing that more effectively. Uh, the caps we're putting on, the affordability caps, do address both production and support costs, so we're, we do have that in place. Uh, we should probably start publishing data pretty soon about those caps and how effective they are. Uh, we probably need to focus, it's in the services side of the house that Alan's working on. Uh, the maintenance services, if you will, PBL is all about that. So controlling the life cycle costs, and one of the things that's it's hard for us to do in general, but particularly hard now that money is so tight, is do the things up front you have to do during the design phase to reduce life cycle costs. Uh, in the F-35, our biggest program, we're putting, a, we're putting a lot of emphasis now on reliability. And it turns out that it was neglected earlier on because people were chasing performance as the fundamental thing. They were concerned about the design process. Um, in retrospect, of course, it's always true that you should have spent more time on reliability. Uh, but that's one of the things we should be focusing on. So we'll be expanding, I think, in the report to try to get into some of those areas. Okay, my next one here is you propose increasing in-house technical excellence for DOD. How is this different from the initiative to bring contractor uh, back in-house or insourcing. It's not about growing the workforce. Insourcing was about making the workforce bigger. Right now I'm trying to protect what I have, frankly, in the workforce. It's about increasing the capability of the people that I have. And it's about when I can recruit, recruiting people with the right skills, the right foundation that we can then build on successfully. So it's, it's not gonna be, uh, insourcing I think is pretty well stopped at this point in time, because we're not growing. Uh, in fact, we're, we're, we're trying to hold our ground essentially in terms of yes, the size of the acquisition workforce. Let me do one other one here. I'll get you in just a second, okay. Uh, from Lucian Niemeyer. Um, do I need to read, are you Lucian? Go for it, go ahead. Results is what might come over to Congress in the form of budget exhibits. That requires PM then to put some thought into what you're trying to do. Is there any effort to try to, to, to get down to the PM level to try to start affecting the, the budget exhibits uh, going from, starting from 16 uh, forward. He's asking if we should be putting our goals into the budget exhibits. Uh, I think you're referring partly to should cost goals. We don't do that. We don't do it for very good reason. The idea, should cost are targets. They're, they're, they're aspirational. And what, I, what everybody's been concerned about ever since we started doing that was that as soon as you write down your should cost, the comptroller or the Congress or somebody will take the money. They'll assume you got the savings. Just because you have an idea of how do you might get some savings doesn't mean you will get them. We, we don't hold our people to the standard of you must achieve your should cost. You must stay within your budget between the, the what we call the will cost, what the, uh, for the major programs, that's the independent cost estimate level usually. And the, the, the should cost is a target. It's a management goal that we're setting. So uh, we do, I think, sometimes talk about our successes where people have achieved it because we want people to get credit for what they've done. We don't let people realize their savings until they actually get them. Uh, first example of this was on the F-35 when Dr. Carter was still in, in, in the undersecretary position. Uh, we achieved a lower price on a fixed price contract. It was our first fixed priced uh, lot of F-35. Then we had it, then the ICE had predicted and we had budgeted to the ICE. So Ash was able to call the services and say, okay, we got the better price. Uh, it's locked in, it's under contract. It's a fixed price contract. I'm gonna let you reduce your budget to come down to the level that we achieved and take that money and use it for something else. And we're gonna assume the same learning curve. We're gonna assume we're on a reasonable learning curve here. So you get a tail from that. You get some money in the out years to take as well. So we, 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 there, there's a real downside to putting these out in public and putting them out to the Congress. Now if I could get the comptrollers of the world and the service and in the and DOD and people on the Hill to not take the money once I put the number on the table, then it would be, it would be willing to do it. But I, that's not the world we're living in, I'm afraid. Okay, I had somebody in the back who I didn't call on earlier. Who, yeah. Uh, thanks. Jim Hasek from the Atlanta Council. Uh, so you were talking earlier about buying things commercially, buying things of a type, buying things where you pay somebody to do the R&D for you and 
and presumably you, you own the intellectual property rights. So I wanted to ask you about IP rights. I noticed in, in version one and version two there was an emphasis on, on thinking through whether or not the department wants and how much of the technical data rights to, to particular weapon systems. Uh, but I don't see it here, and so I wondered, do you feel that this is a nut we've cracked, this is a problem you've, you've, you've gotten a good handle on IP rights, or is that still in grain? No, it's still an issue. Um, I think it'll always be an issue. Uh, it's not here, but it's sort of subsumed under the modular design piece. And it's, it's one of the things on the earlier chart from 2.0 we said we're continuing. You know, it just didn't emphasize to you. Uh, we're doing better training for our people on intellectual property rights. And I think we're doing a better job of working with industry on them. You know, industry has a right to those intellectual property rights. They're called rights for a reason. They belong to industry. Um, industry uses them, and I used to do this when I was in industry. Industry uses them to establish a better competitive position. So we have to understand that. That's a tension in the relationship, if you will. Uh, we want to be able to go out and have competition and often break out components for future competition uh, once we, we've gotten them. So we need to respect industry's rights. We need to cut good business deals with industry that are as much as possible win-win, pay a fair price for that intellectual property when we need it. Uh, but it's a very, very complicated area of the law. It's a very, very complicated area of contracting. So our, our, what we're going to continue to do is try to train our people, try to make sure they understand this as much as possible, and then cut effective business deals that are fair to industry, but also get what the government needs. That, that's going to always be an area, I think, of some tension, I think just because of the nature of the beast. Uh, but our policy, I think, is clear at this point in it. We just got to continue to execute and continue to train our people. Um, next one here is eliminate bureaucracy. Program officers have grown, program offices, I think it says, have grown during the war. We haven't seen the size of offices come down as budgets have come down. How will you streamline these offices? It's a good question. Um, it's, an, it's an area we ought to take a look at. There are headquarters reductions going on. Some of the services are applying those, I think, incorrectly from the intent, which is they're taking, if they're, the requirement was a 20% reduction in headquarters. Headquarters means headquarters. It doesn't mean organizations that are not operational organizations. So I have a number of agencies that report to me. There are a number of systems commands, for example, in the services. Those systems commands uh, are, are not headquarters. They have a headquarters, but they are not a headquarters. And we've got to be careful about how we apply that. We are looking at that. We are looking at the size. I think there's pressure on the workforce in general. And I think acquisition is probably going to have to pay some of the price we have to pay there uh, to get within our budgets. I just want to protect it as much as I can, and I want them to be efficient. It's a worthwhile thing to take a harder look at. As I look at the contracting in support of our program offices, uh, we need to make sure that that's adequate too. The services have very different approaches in some cases, and buying commands have very different approaches to how they staff offices. So we, we, we don't necessarily want to impose a one-size-fits-all on everybody, uh, but we probably ought to be paying more attention to that to make sure that people are doing something that's reasonable within their, their own context. Uh, email one, Pro protests have become almost reflexive and are increasing. This slows progress. How to limit it? Uh, companies have a right to protest. If they have a reasonable reason uh, to think that they were not treated fairly or that something was done improperly in the source selection process, then you have the right to protest. Um, we, we, normally that you know, is a period of a few months to get that resolved. The, generally, we stop the program for that. Uh, we don't award the contract. We don't continue. There are cases where, because of the economics or because we're very, very confident of our position, where we go ahead and start work anyway and accept the risk associated with that. Um, I, I would never tell anybody you know, not to protest. I think I, I, you shouldn't protest frivolously. Tight money leads to that kind of an environment. If there aren't many targets and you're betting your company on every one you're betting on, uh, then you're much more likely to protest. And that's, that's just a fact of life, I think, in the environment we're living in. Um, on the ground, I'm seeing, there's a multi-part question here, but I'll get them all. On the ground, I'm seeing and hearing BBP simply means less profit. That is absolutely not the case. Okay? We've said this from day one. We've been saying it for four years. Uh, we want to make sure our workforce understands this. This is not about cutting costs by cutting profit. It never has been. It never will be. It's about cutting costs by cutting cost. It's about incentivizing people to cut costs by tying their profit to their performance. Uh, our, our industry makes a reasonable profit margin. I've looked at it, looked carefully at the data. It's grown a point or so over the years. Uh, it hasn't grown disproportionately. Defense product firms should not expect to be you know, high, high growth, you know, Googles and Facebooks of the world. That's not the business they're in. They're somewhere in the range between utilities and kind of standard commercial manufacturing companies for the most part. 
uh, and they should expect a reasonable return. The nice thing you have in the defense industry is that your customer posts his five-year plan for you every year, so you know what he's going to spend pretty much. Sequestration makes that a little harder. Um, and you know, your customer pays for your R&D. That's not a bad business to be in. From the point of view of uh, the capital you have to raise and the return on that capital, it's a, it's a good investment. We tend to pay cash flow for people. So the re you, know, you, you can get a good, depending on which rate of return you look at, you can do very well in the defense business. Your overall margins, I think, are reasonable. For R&D, this is in the report we put out, but the programs we analyzed, for R&D on major programs, margins were about 6% on the average. And for production, they were about twice that. And the, me the message in there is you ought to get out of R&D and get into production as fast as you can. If there isn't an incentive built into that, I don't know what, what incentive there is. Um, uh, it's interesting that people talk about how we don't execute more effectively. I don't think we're not executing more effectively because we're not trying. The business motive to ex execute a development program and get into production is very high. You want to get into production as quickly as you can, and then you want to get the production rate up as quickly as you can as well. Um, <clears throat> so be, anyway, better buying power is not about reducing profit. It's about using profit effectively. It's about giving industry a fair return, uh, but getting a good business deal in the process. Does the department envision creating an intellectual property strategy detailing how taxpayer-funded IP should be treated and, re and reused? Um, I'd like to have more input on that from uh, the person who emailed this in. I'm not sure exactly what he had in mind by a strategy. I mean, we have policies in place. Uh, we're trying to identify where we need IP and uh, negotiate that. We're, we're using the competitive phase when we have more, more leverage, frankly, in negotiation uh, to evaluate the IP position we'll be in. That's a fair thing for us to do on our side uh, so that we get better deals early on. Uh, because we moved to a sole source environment fairly early in the product life cycle, we need to make those decisions up front. A lot of the IP, IP we need is more about having competition uh, later in production or in sustainment. Uh, and, and we just need to manage that carefully, uh, make sure we do a good job identify the IP, don't pay for stuff we don't need, understand what we have. Uh, we have a lot of IP that comes to us just from buying the product. So it, it automatically belongs to us. Uh, but others, we need to understand what industry's IP position is and then make a decision about what the right thing to do is for us on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, another hand out there anywhere? I still got a couple in my hand, I'll do these. And David's still bringing, oh, wow. <laughs> I'll just do these for a while. You can all relax if you want to. Um, okay, this isn't, oh, wait a minute, here we go. Okay, this one, David, is yours. This is not mine. Okay. This is, these are your instructions, David. You're not listening, David. These, these are yours. <laughs> Bad editing. <laughs> What is your office doing to address a procurement workforce that is grossly overworked and understaffed? Um, our workforce is overworked and understaffed right now. Uh, we're, we're, we're doing, an, uh, we're, we're, the, body, the burden on our workforce is pretty high. I think people need to recognize that out there. Uh, we also have a young workforce, and a lot of people have come in. We, we did go through a period which ended a couple of years ago. We did go through a period of significant growth in the workforce. We brought a lot of contracting people in. We brought a lot of engineering people in. Uh, many of them are entry level, and they are they're starting to develop the skill sets. We have a demographic issue. A lot of our most senior people are leaving. So there's the standard you know, demographic of the two, two humps, if you will. And a lot of people are approaching retirement and leaving the workforce. And there's a valley. And then there are the younger people that we brought in. Um, I, we're, we're aware that it's hard out there right now, and we're aware that people have to prioritize. One of the things we did in results of some of the feedback we got was we backed off on some of our requirements from earlier versions of Better Buying Power. Uh, we were asking people to do recompetes for service contracts, for example, on a fairly high cycle rate, and we just don't have the capacity to do that. So we're, we're, we're aware of this. Uh, the services need to be aware of this, because that's where most of the manpower decisions are made, and that's the reason I'm going to look at this carefully as we go through the budget process this year, and try to make sure we hold the ground. Uh, another anonymous, does 3.0 address deadlines that were missed by 2.0? We did miss some deadlines. Uh, we do track them. We have a business senior integration group that meets about every month, and its job is to uh, track progress on implementation. It's also trying to identify new ideas. A lot of things come in 
that people see around the community uh, where there's a good practice, a best practice. We bring it into the business sink so everybody else knows about that. Uh, all the people that I read the names of at the beginning of the, of the talk are involved in that and quite a few others. So we, we do try to incorporate those ideas and we don't meet every deadline. Um, I believe in setting realistic deadlines and meeting them wherever you can, but I also believe in putting a little bit of pressure on people to, to, to do a good job and to try to do a little better than they might otherwise. So uh, we're not perfect, but I think we're making good progress and have been over the last few years. I think uh, we are approaching sure. the time. So Let me see if I get a really question. juicy ones, David. All right, you know, a juicy one? I'm afraid we took the juicy ones out. <laughs> I'm going to do this one because I think it's important. You mentioned concern about global competitors taking away our U.S. technological advantage. Who are those competitors? And how realistic is the concern that they can compete with a budget like DOD's? Um, I would put at the top of the list China followed by Russia. And it's not that I expect to go to war with either of them, uh, but I expect them to sell their equipment to a lot of people we couldn't possibly go to war with. I, I also expect there to be competitions for influence with those countries. And military power is one of the things that affects your influence in the world. Uh, and you don't have to look very far uh, or very far back in the news to understand that those countries are trying to exert influence over the United States. Uh, I would much rather be in the situation that we have enjoyed for the last you know, 30 odd years of being clearly the dominant military power on the planet. I think we live in a great country and I think the world benefits enormously from the fact that we are the dominant military power in terms of stability and peace around the world. I, I would definitely not prefer to be in a situation where that wasn't true. I have been looking at investments by China particularly, but also by Russia for over four years now. When I left the Pentagon uh, in 94, after my first uh, several years there, uh, intelligence estimates at the time were that China was not really much of a problem, uh, but it could be a problem 15 years or so down the road. I'm back 15 years later, they were right. Uh, China's developing weapon systems to give you some examples that include ballistic missiles that target our aircraft carriers, cruise missiles that target our ships in general, uh, that target ballistic and cruise missiles that target airfields and logistic nodes. Uh, they're building a very robust suite of anti-satellite capabilities uh, that, that uh, threaten every one of our satellites in orbit. They're building very good electronic warfare capabilities. They have a very strong doctrine of inform informationalized war which includes cyber, which they're very aggressive at, and they're doing a great deal in electronic warfare area. They're building a, a fifth generation fighter, to two of them actually, to contest uh, the F-35 and the F-22. They're building advanced air-to-air -air weapons. Um, uh, they are a serious, formidable technological competitor. And it, it, it bothers me that we are, the United States is at this time, sitting here looking at sequestration as our way to manage the budget and cut funding out of defense. At the time when we have global responsibilities for national security, they're only increasing. We just committed to operations in Iraq. Uh, we've got the problem with Ukraine and how to manage that with NATO. We're still in Afghanistan and we're gonna be involved, we expect in Afghanistan on a smaller scale for some time. Uh, we're dealing with a lot of real life right now problems and we have emerging threats. You look at the behavior of Russia. Russia has been using its energy revenues to invest significantly in modernization of its military. It's building uh, capabilities that are uh, comparable in some ways to the ones I described for China. It's also moving to a doctrine which relies more heavily on tactical nuclear weapons, which is worrisome to me. So I, I, I don't think we can be complacent at all. I think we should be quite concerned about our technological superiority. Uh, and this shouldn't be a new thought to many of you here. I've been talking about this. I've given a lot of testimony about it. Uh, Secretary Hagel's talked about it. Secretary Panetta talked about it. Uh, and yet we're sitting here under the threat of sequestration. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. Okay, thank you very much.